here we go. Uh, yes, we are ready. Okay, and let me. How do I get the PowerPoint at the bottom? Okay. All right, and I'll collapse all of these. Okay, so the, the title of this 30-minute uh, uh, session is going to be Task to Help Students Kickstart a Language Lesson. Now, this works whether it is in the classroom or it is distance learning. Now, the first task the students do in a language lesson is very crucial. If we design it right, it will help most of the students get a toehold for the rest of the lesson. Now, <clears throat> why is this important? When we come into a classroom or when we're doing distance learning, there are several factors that are at play. Number one is the language. The students were speaking their native language before they came into the classroom. And it takes uh, uh, some time for the mind to move from the native language to the target language. The, the second problem is that when you are doing something else, whether it's uh, another class of uh, algebra, or it can be, you know, they were doing something that was occupying their mind, just because a teacher starts speaking doesn't mean everybody gets on board and hear. I mean, really listen because everybody can hear. So the words can be spoken by the teacher or by a video. That doesn't mean that the student is, is really listening to that. So this is what we're gonna focus on. I'm going to take these tasks from rudimentary to poetry because I know that you're working on some poems. It's not enough time for me to do much more. It, it needs a lot of time, so I'm going to focus on this. So the first task that a student does, and when I say student, I mean each individual and all 30 of them, needs to have the following principles embedded. The task should create a heightened attention for the student. So when the student's attention is high, they will be more likely to learn. And this is a researched and proven, uh, proven through research. The attention is high, more comes in. So we need to design the task in such a way that it increases the attention span of the students. Now, what I've noticed a lot in the classroom is teachers say, pay attention, listen carefully, but that doesn't necessarily mean that students will automatically go into that mode. There will be room for questions at the end and comments if you don't have them. The first task needs another uh, principle to be embedded. It needs to give the learners a sense of direction. Again, when you know where you're going, when you have a meaningful sense of direction, you will be more likely to learn. So the task itself has to be designed in such a way that all the students can get a sense of direction in the, very in the very first five minutes. Now, what I've noticed again from <clears throat> classroom management is that teachers are required to write the objective on the board and to tell the students, I'm sorry, I think I need to bring, uh, admit somebody. Okay. Yeah, so when, when you write an objective on the board or you tell the students what they're going to learn, <coughs> Most students may not understand the objective because of the way it is worded or might not be actively listening during the time the teacher is telling them what they're going to learn. And uh, the, 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 the special content area words or cognitive verbs might not register. So if you haven't really learned it and an objective is written for it, the objective might not make sense to the students because they don't have the concept and they're going to learn about it. Now, uh, when I work with teachers, I always say use plain English for the objectives, something that can be understood by everybody and is not vague. 
or can be misinterpreted. The next one, task, and this is one of the most important ones. The principle is code switching. So if the students had been speaking in their native language before they came into the lesson, whether they're at home or in a classroom, they will be left behind because in code switching, the research has shown that adults who speak a foreign language take about 15 minutes for their minds to completely shift from the native language to the target language. So you can imagine students whose uh, first language is not English and are not highly competent at that language, it might take a lot, mo a lot more. Now, I'm not talking about the two or three people who you know, switch faster, uh, have higher attention, because in every classroom, we've got some of those, but I'm talking about all or the majority. So we need to design the task in such a way that it helps all the students switch from their mother tongue to the target language they are learning. Now, here are a few things that I have noticed. For example, sometimes when teachers ask the students the meaning of a word or a question that needs higher command of English to answer, they are actually redirecting students to go back to thinking in their mother tongue. One of the questions I've heard a lot is, for example, something really simple. For example, what's the meaning of mug? Well, everybody you know, in the classroom can, can probably imagine mug with an image, but cannot verbalize it in English. So the tendency would be for the mind to go back to the native language and try to explain it, whether the student opens his or her mouth to speak or not. Um, another thing, uh, for example, when the question cannot be answered by everybody. For example, uh, today we're going to be learning about adjectives. Okay, what is an adjective? Well, since we're going to be learning about it, why are we asking that question? Now, again, the fourth principle here is very important. If all the students are actively able to take part in the task at the same time, and feel they are able to challenge others, regardless of their level of English, it will create a motivating situation for them. So in other words, when we put in a question or a task that can be only done by 10%, 20%, 30%, or even more than 50%, but not everybody, the people who cannot do the task automatically get left behind. So they will never have that hook or toehold to start building the concept of the lesson that you're teaching them. Now, the task is always designed on a, a, in such a way that it requires a student to hold information longer. Sorry, let me again uh, admit somebody. Right. The task is designed in such a way it requires a student to hold information longer, access information from more than one source, or provide multiple responses. So when the task is within the reach or the ability of a student, he or she will be more inclined to do it. However, if the task is too easy or too difficult, the student may not be motivated to do it. So here, the task is not cognitive as much as it is psychomotor, uh, where people who don't know English as well as the others will have this a, a level playing field for everybody to work from the same, the same platform or the same jump. Now, so my focus today, a short time that is available, is going to be on vocabulary task designs for different levels and for different purposes. Now, this one is a very low level opening task for young learners, maybe kindergarten or in government public schools where they're learning English for the very first time, maybe fourth grade. So the listening part is under one minute and may contain the word that they are listening to or for up to five times. So let's look at the instructions that the teachers will give. Remember, this cannot start uh, from uh, cold turkey, ground zero. Uh, all these tasks 
have to be learned and demonstrated with familiar things, and then it's done with unfamiliar. So we cannot learn the words and the task at the same time or the tool. So what we're doing is we're learning the tool with things that are familiar and easy. Once we master the tool, we move it to content that needs to be learned. Here's an example. The teacher said, we are going to learn five words today. The first word is plain. Listen to the story I'm going to read you. Count on your fingers the number of times you hear the word plain. So notice that this cannot be done the first time. It has to be done several times with familiar words such as ice cream and things that pizza that the kids already know until they're familiar with this task tool. Now, I'm going to read you a story for kindergarten level, and I would like everybody to count on your fingers. Counting on your fingers just means you put the finger up uh, when, when you hear the word plain in a story. Do we do that with you now? Yes, uh, just, you know, just for the sake of uh, being physically, physically responding, okay? All right. So everybody's on? Yeah, just, just uh, every time you hear the word plain in the story, you will just put a finger uh, like you're counting on your fingers. Okay. Today we're going to the airport. At the airport, I saw a plane. The plane was on the runway. People were waiting to see the plane take off. And that's it. So you should have heard the word plane maybe three times. Okay. Yes. What is not important is the correct answer. That is not important at all. Oh, Whether you mean they said two or don't four. care about the correct answer. What is important is now, of course, you can make a big show of this is the correct answer. But inside you as a teacher, don't feel frustrated or disappointed if some of the students did not hear the right number, because this is not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is, uh, and we're going to say them later. Now, after you finish hearing the story, we can read the story more than one time. Okay. Now, let's do it together slowly. Listen to the story. So you gave the students a second chance. You might insert the word plain another time in your story, or you might remove it. It doesn't matter. What is important is heightened attention that I don't need to understand the story. My ear needs to catch the word plain. And finally, show each other with your fingers how many times you heard the word plain. Now notice this comparison with each other is not, oh, teacher, I was right. Yes, I was the only one with the right answer in the classroom, but it's more of a challenge on a pair level. Now let's look at how the task worked. Oh, sorry. Now let's do it for again for another word and depends whether you have five words, four words, 10 words for today and how much time you've got. So this is the opening task at a very low level for words that the students are going to learn. They haven't started learning here. What we have done is we have heightened the attention in order for the students to count the word. So they need to increase attention span. We gave them a sense of direction. No doubt that they're going to be learning these five words. The students do not understand the words they hear. Neither do they understand the story. But this task will say, listen, these are the words. And for us to learn, notice we did all the five words. The short-term memory holds these five words. So in the next task, when we start with an, uh, a task that helps them understand the words, those words are already present. Whereas in the traditional way, the, the teacher unfolds one word at a time and the, te the student doesn't know when it, this is gonna end. Is it going to be a hundred words today? Is it going to be two words? And the word you know, just jumps out of the blue. So the, the idea here is that we're working on uh, uh, brain science as well and short-term memory. And once, the, the word is exposed to the student through this task, it's there and ready for the next task. Code switching. 
Well, <laughs> there is no chance that you can think in your first language because the students are focusing on hearing the word plane embedded in the short English story. So they will move from the mother tongue to thinking uh, in the target language faster. So this is how we make code switching faster. You drown, uh, I, I, I'm not saying Arabic is not good. I'm just saying you're gonna learn a new language. You have to create two different paths in the brain. And what you have done here in this task, you have drowned the, the mother tongue and put the focus only on the target language. Now let's look at challenging. Can every student do it? Yeah, it's easy. I mean, they will not all get the same words, the same answer, but everybody can do it. Now let's go to the second one. This one is mid-level and it can be for early teens in a government school or uh, it can be for elementary in, in an international school. So let's look at what we're going to do. We are going to learn five words today. Look at the words we're going to learn on the board. They are muffin, raspberry, cream, shortbread, and smoothie. Now here is, that's the teacher speaking the instructions. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen to the story I'm going to read you. When you hear one of the words in the list, make a stroke mark next to it like this. For example, the story starts, um, I was hungry, so I went and opened the refrigerator and I saw a muffin. You make a stroke mark next to it. So the best way is to give these kids, uh, you know, these words printed. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody I need to let in again. All right. So every time you hear a word, you make a stroke mark next to it. Now notice that this is beginning literacy because you have to hear a word and you only have five or six to compare. It's definitely for people who know the letters of the alphabet and have learned some English, but these words are new. Uh, and then I continue the story. Well, my mother told me not to eat the muffin, so I make the next stroke mark. And it doesn't have to follow the order, raspberry cream, shortbread, and smoothie. It can be smoothies coming next, etc. Now, the reason we're doing this, again, you are hearing these words in the story, and the student is making a stroke mark next to each word on the small piece of paper that you gave him or her with these words. What is happening is that, let's look. What happened here? Let's try it together slowly, listen to the story, and make a stroke mark next to it in pairs show each other the stroke marks you, man, you made. Now, notice that the hand is moving. In the first easy task, it was the fingers. Now, in the higher level task, the hand is still moving. And this is one of the problems. Every time you are listening or reading and you don't do a physical movement such as speaking and writing and drawing, the brain tends to forget those notes. Let's look at the importance. If you're going to hear a story and make stroke marks next to each word, then your attention span will increase automatically. If you know that these words, let's say like each word, you gave two to three stroke marks, and you know these words are gonna appear so many times in the, the <coughs> story that you're going to listen to or read, it gives a sense of direction that you're going to be learning these words. Code switching, again, uh, I'm sorry, I need to fix one of the words there down there. But you cannot make a stroke mark next to, the, next to the word muffin that you hear in a story if you're not listening in English. Again, the native language has been drowned between quotation marks. And finally, everybody can do it. It's not difficult. Let's move the level up. Oh, by the way, now, if you feel that the students uh, uh, need some help, you might put the words to appear in order in the story. So as you're reading the story, only muffin will appear first, then only raspberry, then only cream, etc. But if you want the level to be higher in the attention span and, and the challenge, 
then the first word that they hear might be smoothie, and then the next word raspberry, then it comes back to smoothie, then it goes to muffin. <clears throat> and uh, this is the higher level. Now, again, it's for vocabulary. We're going to learn five words today. Look at the words we're going to learn on the board. They are numbered. So you put the words on the board with numbers next to them, one, two, three, four, five. And you might ask the student, you know, to say, when I say the word, say the number, equate, you say five, etc. But here is what we need to do. Listen to the story I'm going to read you. When you hear one of the words, write its number on your paper. So you can see now that on the paper, they're going to write only the number of the word that they heard in the story that corresponds to the number in front of the word on the board. So the paper is only going to have numbers and it will look something like this. Let's try it together slowly. Listen to the story. When you hear one of the words, write its number. So let's try this together, gentlemen. Don't look at the sequence number here. I'm going to do it in a different way. Jimmy has done a lot to achieve what he has done in his life. But he was able to use appropriate time every time he did this. And, and you got the idea. So you must have written uh, two as first, number as first, then one, etc. And again, this is, you can make it easy by having these words appear in order, but that would not be nice because then they would write only one, two, three, four, five, and we don't want that. We want these words to appear in the story more than once, two to three times at least. And if you make it, want to make it uh, very, very difficult. Uh, sorry, what happened? <clears throat> we can hear you and see you. You can still see it? Yes, we see the okay. slide. All right, good. The students, uh, sorry. So you might put, let's say, for appropriate five, for equate one, for restrict two. Now notice that the attention of the listener observer has been heightened or challenged even more. Because if they're in sequence and you hear a word, all you need to do is go down the line and the numbers and write the, the number. But if the numbers are jumbled in front of the words, then it takes, uh, it takes more attention or more heightened attention span because it's more challenging. And always at the end, we always ask the students, in pairs, show each other the order of the numbers you wrote. Now look at the story on the screen and check. Notice I did not give them the answers. I didn't say, here is the sequence of the numbers. I said, here is the story that you just read in print on the slide. Now, if you don't have it on the slide, you can say, open your books to page 85. Look at the text, look at the story. Now look at the words. <clears throat> so notice what you have done. You have heightened the attention. You have given them a sense of direction that this is gonna be a vocabulary lesson with these words. You have created code switching because <clears throat> there is no way you can write the number of the word in a sequence unless you are listening in English and looking at the word in English. But the D part is the clincher. I will not give you the answer. Look at the story. Look at the story. Open the books, look at the story, or look at the story on the slide. Now you check to see if you've got the sequence right. I hope that this was clear and it came across. Now, <clears throat> uh, we're going to do a poem because that's what you've been working on. The instructions are, search the poem for words that end with the same sounds and circle each set with the same colors. So notice now, again, it's been heightened to a level and you assume that the students can find words that end with the same sound. Now notice I said end with the same sounds versus saying words that rhyme. 
because again, when you just walked into the classroom, the kids were probably speaking in their native language or some people are not. The word rhyme does not conjure the concept as well as words that end with the same sounds. Now, we can also do this for alliteration and you can say words that start with the same sounds, words that have five syllables. You can use the same tool. That's why it's called a tool because it can be used multiple times with different purposes of learning. So let's have a look. Write each set of words in a web cluster. Now write the words or short two word details that can be associated with each word to make a concept map. Use the words you generated to write short notes in phrase or sentence forms and in pairs tell each other. Let me show you now an example. We're going to look at a poem, search a poem, you know what happens. Here's the poem, Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. So we're looking for words that end with the same sounds and we need to <coughs> circle all those words that end with the same sound with one color, fire, desire, fire. I don't know if I missed something else. And now another set of rhyming words or words that end with the same sound with a different color, ice, twice, ice, suffice. So notice again, the, the kids have to have heightened attention. They need to search the text for the words. The brain is functioning in rhyme now. How do they end? What's the sound? Again, you can see this later on. It's heightened attention, sense of direction, code switching, and challenging. Everybody can do it. Now, we said, write each set of words in a web cluster and write the words or short two, words de two word details that can be associated to each word to make a concept map. So we wrote the first cluster, which was fire desire, and the second cluster on a piece of paper, twice I suffice. And now we have moved up to a higher level because we know that the students are, are above the uh, beginner's level and fire, desire. What comes to your mind when you hear fire, desire? Want something, strong passion, feel hot. No two students might write the same thing. And that is what we want. And if we look at the second cluster, no passion, number of times, enough, no more, very cold. But these are my thoughts. So you and every single person may write something different because this is coming not just from what you see, but also what you have experienced in the past. So you are activating prior knowledge in this one. Excuse and, me. Because yes? it's right on the screen that we still have four minutes. Yes, I'm moving faster. It's oh, the end. Yeah. So use these words you generated to write short notes and phrase or sentence forms. Fire makes me feel hot. I have a strong passion for good movies. Ice makes me feel cold. I like to see a good movie twice. Two times is more than enough. So again, each student might write different things. But why are we doing this? Because I understand when you go into studying anything, whether it's a poem or a passage, we have to activate the prior knowledge that a person has in order to act upon and engage with what you're reading and listening. It cannot go cold turkey. It has to be prepared. Now, once the students do this enough, you can, this is the scaffolding, you can start to remove it because then they will do it automatically. But in the beginning, there is, it is important that they do each one of these until they develop the automaticity of the process. And this is why sometimes in tests or under pressure, we, we make a mistake because our brain has not received, re reached an automaticity procedure. And this brings me to the end. The opening task should not be more than 10% of the learning time. That is, if you have a 50 minute class session, the task should be five, five minutes. If you have 110, okay, 10 to 11 minutes or less it should not be 20% or 30% of the session. Then it's not an opening anymore. And to sum up, 
This is what happened. In addition to embedding all the following into the first task, heightened attention, sense of direction, code switching, the most awesome part is that the design has created a game-like challenge that every student can take part in and feel some sense of ability. The most demotivating thing is when you're left out and, and research psychology into social psychology has done MRI and PET scans to show how the brain reacts when somebody is left out. And what's more, the mind's core concept about the subject at hand is prime. So the first five minutes, the way we design, it primes the brain and ready to move to higher thinking. So you do not advise us, uh, Eli, to start teaching the new skills directly. We need to have some attention grabbing activities and code switching yeah. activities. Yeah. Meaning that Since we have less than a minute, I can uh, do another question and comment extension if you want. Okay. Or um, if you want, you can put your questions in written form and I will do my best to answer them. That will well, give you some time, right? Uh, it takes time to okay. type questions. Gentlemen, right. if you have any Thank questions, you for Mr. participating. And, uh, yes, yes, I have a question, Mr. We, we don't have Eli, please. Time. We don't have Quick. enough time to answer the question. I have less than a minute and it will run out. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Mr. Eli. I, uh, yeah. If I have some time, just a, one, one question, please, quickly. Go ahead, go ahead. It's going to be yeah. cut up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Mr. Eli, uh, uh, when you talk about vocabulary and you to tell the, uh, the students a story, uh, how do you choose the story that is related to that, the, the vocabulary that you are going to teach? Okay, when it's five minutes and the story is a minute, you're taking some.